Hello everyone, my name is Vicky Balabansky and I'm speaking to you today from Adelaide. My topic is reflecting on the cosmic Christ. In Christ all things were created, all things hold together and all things are reconciled. I'm speaking um, about this big topic um, as a biblical scholar so I want to trace some of the, um, the theology uh, which leads us to reflecting on, on the cosmic Christ. That there is a cosmic scope to the person and work of Jesus Christ is actually not a late affirmation. It goes back to some of our earliest biblical texts, our earliest New Testament writings. So for instance, 1 Corinthians, um, written around about the uh, 54 uh, CE um, year. And, um, and in this letter, Paul in passing mentions the fact that he believes that there is not only one God the Father, but also one Lord Jesus Christ through whom are all things and through whom we exist. So already in the relatively early 50s, Paul um, was conveying to the Corinthian community that Jesus was not just you know, um, a man alongside other men, but in fact, this cosmic figure the one through whom are all things and through whom we exist. Of course, he goes on to mention it is not everyone that has this knowledge, so not everybody yet recognises that. But for Paul and for, for those to whom he was writing, this was, was clear already in the 50s. We think about um, Paul's letter to the Philippians and the Christological hymn that we find embedded in chapter 2. So Philippians 2, 5 to 11, um, and that was written presumably in the early 60s, but it was citing an earlier hymn, and, and Paul writes, Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself. So already um, Paul can be confident that his Philippian recipients of, of the letter um, recognised that Jesus was in some sense kin with God and in order to become human emptied himself. So again there's a cosmic scope to that. In his letter to the Colossians, now of course the um, authorship of this letter is disputed, but um, I've done some particular research on this uh, letter which I don't think that the bulk of it wasn't written by Paul himself, but Paul was still alive and um, did write the opening and closing sections, in my opinion. We have another Christological letter, um, uh, sorry, another Christological hymn in this letter, and it, uh, it also affirms the cosmic scope of Jesus. It says, He is the, invisible, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, Things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. That's a remarkable claim, isn't it? Through him and for him. In another letter, probably not Pauline, um, the letter to the Hebrews, um, it opens with similar, a similar idea. In these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. So that the author of this letter to the Hebrews is also affirming that through Jesus the universe came into being. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. So um, the Son, Christ, is not only the one through whom all things are made, but through whom all things are sustained. And then, of course, um, our very familiar and much um, loved text, the opening of John's Gospel. In the first four verses we read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life. So again, the cosmic scope of Christ is affirmed in Paul's writings, in 
the letter to the Hebrews, in the Gospel of John, and uh, in Revelation, we also glimpse this, um, uh, this, this vision. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the origin of God's creation. So the words of the Amen, referring to Christ, um, described as the origin, or the Arche, the Greek word Arche, it can mean origin, or it can mean ruler, or principle, or beginning. And uh, in, in many ways, um, that ambiguity of the word arche is, um, is important for our understanding of this cosmic scope of Christ. So, the cosmic scope of, God, of Christ's person and work mirrors the cosmic scope of God. In fact, Christ as um, that image of the Father, that arche, um, makes God visible and tangible. So we have many different affirmations in the New Testament from early on that Christ is the image of God, he was in the form of God, he is the Son of God and Lord. And all of those affirmations speak about the cosmic scope of Christ. Now, perhaps that's not so surprising. We all know um, through our uh, reflection on the Trinitarian theology that, that um, uh, the second person of the Trinity is all those things. But it is worth pausing for a moment and, and thinking, how did people actually realise that? How did they come to that affirmation so quickly? Where did the ideas come from? And what does it mean to claim that in Christ uh, the God of the whole cosmos is incarnate? and that in Jesus Christ all things came into being. And third, the cosmic Christ has ecological implications, and that's why we're thinking about this today. What ecological implications can we find in this, um, in this theology? So these are the three uh, topics for my, for my presentation. First of all, where did the ideas come from, and where did they come from so quickly? Um, the first thing to be said is that already in Jewish reflection, there was a strong wisdom theology. It came and is reflected in a number of writings, particularly um, the book of Proverbs, chapter 8, verses 22 and 23. The Lord created, ektisem, me, as the beginning, the arche again, of his works, before his deeds long ago. From eternity I was appointed, from the beginning, from before the world existed. So already um, in the Jewish tradition, people were reflecting on the wisdom of God as the one who was in the beginning, from eternity, uh, before the world existed. And later, Proverbs um, uh, 8.30 says, Then I was beside him as a master craftsman, and I was his delight day by day, rejoicing before him at all times. So already the notion that wisdom, Sophia, um, was a, a beside God and active in creation and crafting the beautiful world is um, a theology that, that people had reflected on. We find this theology as well in some other writings in Sirach. Um, so wisdom is described as God's companion in creating. Wisdom was created before all other things and prudent understanding from eternity. Or in the Book of Wisdom, chapter 9, O God of my ancestors and Lord of mercy, who have made all things by your word and by your wisdom have formed humankind to have dominion over the creatures you have made. So this is part of a speech and again affirming that in some sense wisdom was um, the one through whom humankind came into being, and in, indeed all creatures. So, that's interesting, but where did this wisdom theology come from? How could a monotheistic faith, like Judaism, uh, affirm that wisdom was alongside God in creation and in sustaining the universe? Well, let me um, say a few words about what was going on in the wider um, context 
the, um, the Hellenistic context in which um, Jewish reflection was going on. The gods of traditional Greek religion were anthropomorphic. So that means you know, they had human characteristics. The sorts of things that they got up to were not always very godly, um, quite often uh, fairly, fairly human, and, and there were many um, failures along the way. So by contrast, thinkers even prior to Plato were already pondering um, a vision of God that, that moved away from that anthropomorphism and, and towards a God who was really different from those sorts of um, shenanigans if, that the traditional gods got up to. Uh, Xenophanes, for example, thought that there is one God who moves everything with a thought, but does not move physically in the process. So Greek thinkers were already um, thinking about God as one and as different from the traditional gods. Plato, in his work The Timaeus, um, writes about God, and he says, that, uh, well, he, he, he writes that God is um, an eternal and perfect being who is always existent and is not subject to any change. That concept of God required a cause to bring other things into being. So God is, in a sense, uh, understood to be removed from the shenanigans of the, of the world, if I may put it that way, and that, that God required in, a, in a, a master worker or a craftsman alongside um, to, to create the world. Pat Plato calls this um, a master worker or a demiurge. The demiurge gazed on the eternal as the perfect model to create the universe. The universe is beautiful because the model for it is beautiful. Now, I found that intriguing because in pagan or philosophical thought, they were already moving in a more monotheistic direction, but recognising that alongside God there must be some creative element or, or wisdom element almost um, uh, working alongside God. And so um, when, we, when we turn back to the Proverbs um, uh, chapter 8, verse 30, uh, we, we read that um, wisdom is speaking, then I was beside him as a master craftsman. In, um, in the Hebrew, it's Amon, and I was his delight day by day, rejoicing before him at all times. So it seems to me that there's a really interesting connection between Plato's Timaeus, affirming God as this uh, eternal and perfect God at, with a, a master worker, and um, Proverbs' affirmation that Indeed, God had wisdom alongside God's person, who was um, a master craftsman. From my point of view, and I think this is widely accepted, thinking about cosmology and cosmogony, that is to say how the world is created and comes into being, those, that type of thinking crossed boundaries in the Second Temple period, um, boundaries between religions, uh, just as it does today. I mean, when we think about cosmology today, we don't just think as Christians or you know, in any other religious tradition. We, we think in dialogue with, with science as it's understood. So back in the Second Temple period, that was already happening as well. In the Jewish tradition, the master worker was God's wisdom. Or, influenced by Stoic thought, God's word God's Logos. So both the words Sophia, wisdom, and Logos, I think, reflect the, the Jewish understanding of, of how the eternal, perfect God um, uh, came to create the world. It's interesting, when we turn to um, some of the writings from you know, the early, um, well, from the first century, perhaps, um, like the Palestinian Targum um, Neophyti in Aramaic, we get this Logos theology articulated very clearly. So in that writing, this link between wisdom and word of the Lord becomes explicit. So Genesis 1 reads, From the beginning, with wisdom, the word of the Lord created and perfected the skies and the earth. And the earth was waste and unformed, desolate of man and beast, empty of plant cultivation and of trees, 
and darkness was spread over the face of the abyss, and a spirit of mercy from before the Lord was blowing over the surface of the waters. And the word of the Lord said, Let there be light, and there was light, according to the decree of his word. Now this is a Jewish writing, but for Christians, we can see that this resonates strongly with, say, the opening of John's Gospel, where in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So this reflection was already going on prior to the the spread of the Gospel and enabled people to recognise in the person of Jesus not just um, somebody who was a perfect man or a prophet, but indeed embodied the Word of the Lord. So I think we have our answer to, to the first question, where did the ideas come from so quickly? The Greek thinkers were rethinking the concept of God away from the gods of mythology towards one eternal divine being. In Plato's Timaeus, which became extremely influential, um, we, we find articulated a, a distinction between the highest God and God's agent in creation, the demiurge. These ideas influenced the various philosophical schools And so Aristotle, for instance, um, talked about an unmoved mover. It also influenced the Stoics, um, who thought of that agent as the Logos. Hellenistic Judaism was influenced by Greek thought and probably influenced Greek thought as well. So I think the influence went two ways. And the master craftsman was identified as God's wisdom. So, our second question, what does it mean to claim that in Jesus Christ, the God of the whole cosmos is incarnate, and that in Jesus Christ, all things came into being. To answer the question, I want to um, consider uh, a couple of further aspects of philosophy, and particularly Stoic philosophy. Stoic philosophy was, in fact, the most widely spread and influential philosophy of the Second Temple period. So um, we we find that hard to glimpse because um, when Christian philosophy developed, it really moved away from Stoic philosophy into a Neoplatonic mode. And therefore, the the influence of Stoicism, I think, is somewhat obscured. Let me tell you a couple of of ideas that the Stoics believed and that kind of permeated culture of... um, Uh, in in the Greco-Roman world, in Asia Minor, for instance. The world is an organic whole, animated and directed by intelligence or reason, by logos. The cosmos is permeated by the logos, which is variously described in Stoic thought as the world's soul, commanding faculty, and spirit or breath, pneuma. Stoic thought, Stoics thought that for something to exist, it must be capable of producing or experiencing some change, and that this condition is only satisfied by bodies or matter, as only corporeal realities can affect other corporeal things. For them, nature and indeed God are embodied. Of course, what they meant by the embodiment of God isn't something very crude, but something um, very fine, a little bit like when uh, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15 about spiritual bodies, that's the sort of idea that they had, it's some, something, something very um, uh, uh, fine, but nevertheless, in a sense, embodied. For the Stoics, freedom is the decision to live according to the logos, or reason, and that decision, that practice, is called homologia, and so move away from a way of life characterised by egoism to a way of life that is devoted through the love and practice of wisdom, to the common good. Now you'll see, if those ideas were influential, and indeed they were, when pagans heard the gospel being preached, they already had some categories of thought um, that enabled them to understand what was being said. So for the Stoics, the divine permeates reality. It's a little bit like when we talk about the spirit, They would have understood that. But the divine does permeate reality, but is most densely present in the sage, the wise person. 
who lives according to wisdom. Now they already thought that way, but they were somewhat pessimistic as to whether there was any sage that fully embodied wisdom. For pagans who heard the gospel, they heard that there is only one true sage in whom the divine was fully present, namely Jesus Christ, the Logos of God. So none of the other sages could fully embody that wisdom. It was only Jesus Christ who, in whom the wisdom of God was fully present. Jesus embodied the divine Logos, the divine word. Because people already thought of Logos as embodied, that was part of their conception of how the world worked, they could also grasp the idea of Jesus as the word become flesh. That wasn't difficult to them. It is a bit difficult for us to see how the divine word could in fact be incarnate in a human being. But for them, if Logos permeated the whole universe, but was also embodied and could be incarnate or embodied in a, in a person, um, the proclamation of Jesus as the embodied word was not difficult for them to comprehend. It was through the word made flesh in Jesus that all things came into being and all things are sustained. That's the proclamation that we already see in 1 Corinthians and across the other New Testament writings. They articulated the cosmic scope of Christ's work in at least three ways. First of all, they connected Jesus as the visible, tangible embodiment of wisdom and logos, and we've seen how they did that. They also talked a lot about theology through prepositions. By that I mean they talked about the one from whom, for whom, through whom, in whom, before whom these things took place. So there was a lot of um, focus in philosophy of the day on, on um, that way of speaking, trying to articulate this truth. And there was also um, an emphasis on the universal scope of Christ. That should say three, by the way. Um, the emphasis on the universal scope of Christ and in particular the, the, um, the term tapanta, all things. So when we look for these um, ways of articulating theology, we find them very clearly expressed. And here we have 1 Corinthians 8 again. From whom are all things, for whom, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. Notice all things are articulated there. Or Colossians. Notice both the prepositions and the emphasis on all things in this, this passage. He is, the invisible, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things, in heaven and on earth, were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in all things. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. What this is articulating is the cosmic scope of Christ. And... Um, by doing it in this way, it's evoking the wisdom theology and also in the pagan tradition, the Stoic concept of, um, of the Logos. That's an article um, that sets out how um, in Jewish wisdom speculation, um, prepositions articulated that metaphysical truth. Now, now I come to the ecological implications. The cosmic scope of the person and work of Christ connects believers with the cosmos. So if Christ is in fact the one through whom all things come into being and in whom all things are sustained, we believers are not separated from all things. Here in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul articulates the way in which um, we are connected through Christ with the universal scope of God's care. He says, for all things are yours, 
all belong to you and you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. We are interconnected through Christ with God and um, you know, essentially the world or life or death or everything, we're connected with those things in this cosmic vision. If all things came into being through the Logos, then the Divine Presence can be glimpsed in and through creation. We can be confident that even though when we gaze upon a, a beautiful um, uh, place in, in nature, we don't see the, everything to do with God, nevertheless we do glimpse um, the reality of God there. All things are connected. Because all things came into being through him, all things are connected. All things are created, sustained and redeemed through the divine word. So the divine word, Jesus Christ and his, um, his, his work, it's not just only about humans, but in fact about all things, about the whole of creation. We are kin with all of creation. And our vocation is to be a people through whom all the families of the earth find blessing, as we read in Genesis 12, verse 3. And I take all families of the earth not just to mean humans or other, you know, other families in other um, nations, but indeed all creatures and all species. This is not a theology of pantheism, worshipping all things, but a theology of panentheism, uh, recognising that uh, everything is in God and everything came into being through God and uh, is reconciled to God through the person and work of Christ. I want to finish um, by drawing your attention to this verse from Colossians. It says, here there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. Christ is all and in all. That's the cosmic scope of this vision and one that I think we need to recover, particularly in the West because it hasn't been our primary theology of Jesus Christ. But it is there from the beginning, from our earliest writings, and, uh, and has great ecological potential. Thank you.